Grandmama, and time for another story from a hometown scrapbook by Ben Weatherwax. Tonight's story, Old Christmases. Hello there. Since we're back smack face to face with that important milestone in the year, the happy day called Christmas, it seems important to take a look backwards at Christmas time at the harbor as it used to be, the ones that old timers sometimes recall as the good old days. So we've dug through records and chatted with old timers and searched our files and we have a few notes that may recall to some of you the Christmases Grays Harbor knew before there was such a thing as radio and talking pictures. When aviation news was made up of speculation on whether man would or would not be able to fly rather than on crashes and disasters. Let's call it old Christmases. And now, Dick, a few words from our sponsor, and we'll get right back to our story. There are a lot of versions of first Christmases on Grace Harbor. Who celebrated the first will probably never be able to establish. Just wrestling a livelihood from the wilderness and controlling loneliness and the longing for the sight of old friends and old places must have occupied most of the time of those hardy early settlers who were scattered along the edge of the Chehalis River and in its saltwater harbor. Of course, they managed something in the way of a Christmas. Kinships were close among those families, such as the Bens and the Redlings, and they found ways of gladdening little hearts with things brought down from stores in Olympia or carried to the harbor in the trading cargo of Captain Lucan's little schooner, the Kate and Anne. Then there was much ingenuity amongst those five frontier matrons who could turn a bit a bright calico into a wondrous doll dress just as fathers could sharpen their knives and whittles wonderful things from a chunk of red cedar or clean new fur. It was after the cities began to grow here that Christmas and its traditions took root and if we take the customs of the years as a basis for our traditions they're pretty rough in those early days. For the cities grew and their industries spread and flourished. At the rough housing, free spending men of the West gravitated to Grays Harbor to work in the woods, the mills, and to man the little sailing vessels that crowded around the wharfs along the city's waterfront. They had two vacations, Fourth of July and Christmas, those hard bitten, hard working, rowdy roused about men. And when the loggers rolled in from the woods, their tin pants chafing a symphony, their cock boots cutting slivers from the board walks of Hoquiam, Aberdeen, and Cosmopolis, the merchants knew that Christmas time had come at last. Much of the harbor's economy in the early years was geared around those two annual influential logger, sailor, sawmen, and workers' holidays. There were free spenders, loud shouters, glad handers, these men, some were young, naive, and inex inexperienced lads from the East and Midwest who had come out to the big timber country to try their muscles. Others were professional bulls of the woods who had spent lifetimes swinging the double bitted axe and whacking the bull teams with two highlights of the year, those two star-lighted holidays that beckoned to them all through the months of hard and tenuous labor at their camps and that were both a means and an end to all work. When the camp shut down for Christmas and the Polson and Little and Old Commercial Company, the Larkin Brothers and the Codwells paid off their crews, often for five or six months work. The commercial machines of Grace Harbor Cities were in gear to avalanche the gold that jingled in their pockets and their tin pans and ready to grab a lion's share of the fortune was the harbor's Barbary Coast, the thriving conglomerate of dance hall saloons, flop houses, and marginal operator, operators who lived handsomely from what they took from the boisterous timber beast over the holidays. Get them full of fire water and roll them 
was the approved recipe for the operator of the harbor's underworld, and many a logger awoke in a dark hallway or at the bottom of a flight of wooden stairs, sick, broke, and beaten at the end of their Christmas time binge. It was the same holiday for the seafaring men, though they had less of a gleaming cash to flash across the bar, less gold twenties to stack on the mahogany. It was nearly a decade after Aberdeen's fire before the administrators of the two cities decided it was time to clean up the towns, chase out the Fagans and the parasites, swamp out the waterfront. And that was the beginning of the cities as we know them today. The name that Grace Harbor had enjoyed for nearly 20 years as the toughest port of call on the Pacific coast began to change. What? Oh, the loggers still rolled in, and they still roared along the street, but they were no longer preyed upon from doorways and back alleys. They could get into trouble if they wanted to, but now they had a fighting chance. Those were the Christmases of 1909 and 1910, and now the schooner fleet docked at the Harbor Mills during the holiday season, followed by a tradition of the seas that made the waterfront one of the most picturesque parts of the whole harbor at Christmas time. For now, each schooner broke out its flags, all of them, its pennants and its bunting at Christmas time, and the decks of the ships from the masthead to the jib with flattering color. And the fore truck of the schooner was lashed a small green fir tree, the seagoer's emblem of Christmas. A Christmas dinner on shipboard was not unusual, with the captain as host, and the town, who now knew these colorful seafarers, often found a place at a family table for the officers of the lumber fleet. It was the era of the Gray Port and the New York hotels in Hoquiam when a bountiful Christmas dinner would be served up in the dining rooms for a dollar or less, and the old menus of the Hotel Washington, Aberdeen's principal hostelry of the era, list Toke Point oysters on a half shelf for just 35 cents, or an Olympia oyster con cocktail for 15 cents. They were approved appetizers of the day, and if you wanted roast turkey as your main course, it was on the menu for 60 cents with all the trimmings. It was an era when stores opened at 8 o'clock in the morning and closed during the holiday season at 10 p.m. In Aberdeen, Karsner's Brothers was apologizing for the high price of turkeys. They had asked 25 cents a pound for the festive bird, and Pal and Ross and Hoquiam had a special on imported jasmine tea if you really wanted to give your family a treat for Christmas. It was the day when A.W. Barclay were advertising men's suits priced from $15. $1.75 would buy a man a new hat if he wasn't too fancy. At, at Blythe and Blythe, had bathrobes priced at $4. If you were filling a Christmas list with items for family, Eiler's Piano Store on East Heron Street would put a new keyboard on your home for just $185. Or if a man of the family wanted to give the lady of the house something special, there was a genuine mink scarf at Kaufman Brothers for just $15. The liquid trimmings for the festive days were priced in the same brackets. The New York Bar in Hoquiam noted in the morning paper that a special Christmas stock had arrived and that a bottle six-year-old spirits would be available at $1.25 a quart. Those would be the years when the churches of the cities were filled on Christmas Eve, when Christmas calls were made on foot as families journeyed to familiar doorways to extend greetings of the seasons when gifts were more often than not Aunt Myra's preserves or Uncle George's russet apples, when Christmas tree lights were candles and each year brought its share of fires from careless use of the illumination, when electric Christmas tree lights were a curiosity and when the most fortunate families were those who could gather around the new Edison phonograph and exclaim of how lifelike it sounded while Uncle Bai changed the cylinders. It was a Christmas of few printed cards and many handwritten letters telling of the activities of the year and the hopes for the future. You'll never recognize Jim, the letter would begin. 
He's grown three inches, and the town is changing too. They have taken up the plank streets and filled with earth from the hills, and now we're going to pave the streets. Oh, we'll have a fine city here. Yes, and when there are Christmases of far visions of long hopes, when the heart warmed at old names and sights of familiar faces and newspapers reported each year unvaryingly that Grace Harbor had enjoyed the finest Christmas of all. Now, Dick, in that connection, suppose you say a few words about this Christmas on behalf of our sponsors. Yes, those were the old Christmases. Ships along the waterfront with green fir trees at their four trunks, the loggers rowing in from the woods to kick their silver off their streets. The stores open till 10 each night. The mail may be making rounds on Christmas Day, just as any other day, carrying the mail, which by today's standards really didn't amount to much. And through the years, Christmas has come to Grace Harbor in every changing way. The windows of Christmas, once filled with jacks, jack-in-the-boxes, ten pins, and dolls, to gladden little hearts and bring noses close to the window, today are filled with mechanical wonders, electronic novelties, atomic toys, the car that was once purchased at Christmas time to surprise and bring joy to a family, boasts such novel improvements as self-starters and side curtains, and today it's automatic shift and clear vision view. The Christmas suit, the Christmas tie, the Christmas candy, yes, even the Christmas tree, have undergone their changes, the change that the years bring. But what about the change of heart, after all? That is what Christmas is all about. And the philosophers have it that it, if it ever changes in the hearts of men, it will be to goodwill, the warmth of old friendships, the understanding that surpasses words, if those ingredients of the heart should ever change, they, and they alone, will change this grand tradition that men call Christmas time. Oh, the old Christmases were good, good to think on, and so were the new ones. And perhaps, after all, there are no old Christmases and no new Christmases, for Christmas is a spirit that moves in the hearts of men, and the Christmas of the Ben family and the Cars and the James and the Nims and the Dabneys and the Campbells were really no different than those we observe today. And the spirit of Christmas never grows old. And we find one more line in our hometown scrapbook. It's about all of you, hometowners and old friends and new. And it says, May this be your finest Christmas ever, and may the joy of this day remain with you throughout the coming year. It's a special wish from Dick Crombie, the voice of our sponsor, and from your hometown scrapbook pilot, Ben Weatherwax. See you Monday with a seamy side of life in a story about Billy Gould. Thanks for listening.